welcome back ladies and gentlemen. We are now on our last session at New Directions 2022. Our final session today is titled Humans and Technology and we are delighted to have a range of views and expertise in the field to discuss the opportunities and challenges that arise as machines and AI are integrated are integrated into our lives. Now, I would like to hand over the session to the chair of the panel, Jeff Stead, Chief Product Officer at my tutor in the UK and considered a global expert in the use of mobile and emerging technologies for teaching, learning, and assessment. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's great having you here at our session. Um, so we, we've been asked to talk to you about AI, human and technology inter intersections, what the, what the future of that might look like. And this is a big topic, like a really, really big topic. Um, sort of elephant-sized big topic. Um, I'm, I'm sure you know the, the, the sort of parable story about the three blind men who find an elephant, and they, one's holding the leg, and the one's holding the tail, and the one's holding the tusks or the trunk, and, and they, they're trying to talk to each other about what this thing is that they've got, and they can't really agree, because one feels like a bit of a snake, and one feels like a, a rock wall, and a, a bit of a rope, and in a way, AI, human technology interactions is like that. It's an enormous topic. And so I'm, I'm super excited to have a, a real panel of experts here. None of us are experts in the same pieces of this elephant. We're, you know, I'm, I'm maybe the tusk guy. <laughs> and Mariana is sort of perfect at the, at the trunk. So, so, so we're, we're all experts in different bits of the ethics and the technology and the use of, of AI and human technology interactions and learning and assessment. Um, but with this big elephant, you're actually also experts at other pieces of the elephant. So what I'm hoping we can do today is have a bit of a fun conversation to just talk through some of the, the challenges, the technology challenges and the human challenges that, that we see coming um, ahead of us. And so there will be space to be answering questions as we go through. But before we do that, I'd love to ask the panel to introduce themselves very briefly and tell us a little bit about their slice of the elephant, their, their, their area of expertise and why they're here. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Mariano Felice. I am a senior researcher and data scientist uh, in the assessment research group at the British Council where I basically propose and advise on the adoption of technology for different projects that we carry out. My expertise is in natural language processing, which is a subfield of AI that deals with processing um, speech and text, um, both in terms of understanding and producing it, and we use that as a resource for carrying out um, end tasks like assessment or generating content. So that's me. Hello, my name is Sarah Bispo, and I actually come to you, I think of myself as a spy. <laughs> I've been a spy for teachers since day one. Basically, I was a high school biology teacher, and I did not like the tests that were coming from the United States. Terrible. I'm like, where did these tests come from? So I went back and got my PhD in measurement and statistics. So I'm a psychometrician. And then I went and worked at ACT on the, um, the college admissions testing for about 17 years. Again, always working as a spy to make sure those tests are good, fair, measuring important things. So then I left ACT in 2020, back out. And I hear about AI being used in assessment at a company called Fine Tune Learning. So back I go. I'm now the chief assessment and learning officer at Fine Tune Learning, making sure that these applications of AI to assessments are using best practices, paying attention to pedagogy, theory of action, task models, all those important things, because without it, the AI might run a little crazy. So that's me. Hello. 
Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kaška Porajska Ponska. I am Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Education and I am based at University College London. Um, I'm also um, a part of the UC UCL, I'm also based in the um, uh, Faculty um, of Education and Society, formerly known as the Institute of Education, but my background is actually in engineering. So, uh, as a scientist, as a, as a researcher, I develop AI technologies, um, but I also evaluate those technologies in real-world contexts at the front line. Um, and as part of this, um, um, I am very much interested in understanding um, how learning happens, how humans learn, and how we can support human learning. So combining uh, the engineering and the social sciences, um, especially educational sciences, gives a, a very um, interesting and very critical uh, perspective on those questions. Uh, but it also importantly provides a, a, a very uh, critical uh, basis um, for understanding how we deploy these technologies in real classrooms. And all of these things are really essential as part of the elephant. You can't really decouple these things and actually hope for um, you know, developing, developing technologies to support human learning that are successful. All of these things have to be taken into, into account. And um, as part of um, you know, now almost three decades of, of my, my research, this, this these, uh, various questions and using technologies to address them um, have, have led me to uh, a new, um, in a new direction. And very recently, I have started also looking at the questions of the ethics of artificial intelligence in education. There are a lot of questions around that, but the, the questions related to AI in education are quite specific in many in many respects, and I hope we will touch on some of them later. Hello, Barry O'Sullivan. I'm the tail of Jeff Elephant because when it comes to knowledge of the nuts and bolts of these systems, I haven't got a clue. To be absolutely honest, I'm interested in the application of AI in an ethical way, but also in a way that allows us to make decisions about people that we can trust in a way that moves away from our traditional views of testing and assessment. Ultimately, I'd like to see a world where there are no tests. That would be the perfect end to my career if I got to that stage. And I see the only way we can get there is through the technology. So I'm in really interested in exploring how we can get to that end. And, and I guess I'll... I'll Close that round. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a, I build digital learning products and digital assessment products. I'm, a, I'm an inventor and a creator, and I work with teams of engineers and designers and educators. Um, that's what I do. It's what I do at my tutor. It's what I've done in previous jobs as well. And so I, I, I think I'm, I'm on the, the sort of sharp end of the stick. Well, I'm not quite sure which end of the elephant that would be, but it's, I'm um, because I'm. I'm interested both in the educational theory and in what's possible in the technology and in the human behaviors that you need to work with to, to encourage students to engage or to try and get a complex topic across. So I'm, I kind of enjoy that intersection of those different spaces. So I, I'm probably the, the sort of pr pragmatic engineer design person, I guess. Um, in the, so thank you very much. You've, you've, you've met our, our experts here. Um, um, you're also our expert, so what we decided to do was to try and use technology to connect to collect questions as we're going through. So I wonder if I can ask you to take your phones out and type in that URL, Slido, long number, or scan the, scan the QR code. Um, we'll be using this throughout the session, so um, it's your chance to post us a question at any time on the way through. It's also, if you're a bit more of a passive question asker, it's your chance to vote other people's questions up and down. So I'm going to start from the most, the most voted question and work my way down the list. You might not get to all the questions, 
but you have you have uh, the ability to steer which questions we answer. We, we we do get around to answering. So please do um, have a go, log in, engage with it. At the very end, we'll also have a, a round of traditional questions and answers if there's not enough on there. So if you don't want to use the technology, that's okay. But you might you, your question might not get we might not get to it. Um, so and the other the other housekeeping thing is we've decided to break this discussion into three different chapters. Um, because the elephant is so big, and because AI itself and technology is so broad, we, we mostly want to focus on the technologies that can influence and impact learning, language, assessment, the, the, the use cases around that. But for the first two chapters, we don't mind being a little bit broader. So the first chapter is going to be, wow, all the amazing things that are happening, all the, the, the rapid evolution of, of different technologies and what, what we're seeing coming in the future. The second chapter will be, ooh, where it's things that have gone wrong or things that are difficult or concerns we have around, around the use of AI and the intersection with humans and tech. And the third chapter is going to be particularly diving into language, learning, assessing, just understanding some of the, the specific use cases that we're sitting around here for. So do feel free to ask any questions as we go through, but I might slightly pick, um, I'll pick one or two at the end of each chapter and then we'll have a big session at the end, of a, a bigger Q&A session. All good? Great. So, um, our first one is what's happening in the world of AI? What, what, what are the emerging trends? What are we seeing? And that was faster than I intended. It seems like go back again. What's happening in the world of AI? Um, this is a question open to our panel, so um, I don't mind who wants to, wants to go first. I'd love to hear from all of you. What, what are you most impressed with or most excited by or seeing at the moment? Who wants to start? As a person who knows least about it, I'm excited by almost everything, and I'm fairly excited by that way. So, um, I think for me, the the ability to communicate with a machine and for the machine to communicate back to me in a way that is pretty well human, and that has so many fantastic opportunities. We need to find out how what those opportunities are, but for me, that's the thing. That's basically anything. I'll agree with anything you're saying. Hi. Um, I'm also excited about a lot of things. Um, I am biased as an engineer. Um, I think one of the most exciting things for me is the ability of the AI to, or at least in aspirations, she says cautiously, um, the ability of AI to extend our capacities in many different ways, uh, from being able to analyze really complex uh, data in, for, in order to attempt at least to predict um, uh, also very complex phenomena uh, that might take place in the, in the future, uh, through the ability to help, for example, um, medical staff, uh, radiographers, for example, to detect uh, in a much more precise way uh, disease like cancer, uh, to more simple and mundane things like being able to navigate uh, spatial uh, geographical spaces. Um, but as a researcher, the most exciting thing uh, for me is um, for someone who actually develops these things and, and, and looks under the bonnet and develops things under the bonnet um, of applications that, um, AI applications. The most exciting thing is in the process uh, that is required to, to design these things. And the process involves um, a really careful um, and considered understanding of the, the kind of knowledge that we, we, we may need to put into those systems, um, the um, the ability, and through, through that, the ability of, of AI to act as a, if you like, a, an, an applied philosophy through which we can actually raise really fundamental questions about who we are, how we function, even if what we do is, 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 is actually results in quite um, reduced models of our, of our understanding. Uh, these models are still very helpful 
as tools for thinking with and for unpacking really difficult um, and fundamental questions. So it's like a philosophical way of thinking about life itself. <laughs> it's a philosophical way of thinking about life itself. It's also a methodology. And it is definitely a research methodology that provides very systematic way in which to examine uh, the questions that we ask. Cool. Sarah? Well, I, when it comes to me, there's two points that I'm most excited about what's happening in AI right now. It's not coming, it's here. One of them is leveraging um, some of the large language transformer models, GPT-3, which I think Jeff is going to talk more about in a moment, but that is the ability of the AI to help in test development. Mainly, where we used to have solutions in test development like automated task generation or automated item generation, which is like a template, like you have blanks and the machine learning fills in blanks. Now we can leverage the large language models to help item writers come up with scenarios, very rich scenarios, long, 800 words, uh, personalized, and help the, the uh, not only come up with content, but also questions and teaching it how to ask high level, high quality questions. That's happening right now. That's what we're doing. The second thing that it's most exciting that's happening right now with my, in, in assessment for me is, um, as Barry mentioned, the ability of the AI to, to talk to you, narrate back what it's thinking is. So for example, we're working with a law school examination kind of situation, and they don't want to rely on one test score. They think their students have more evidence than that. So they're looking at using a syllabus, and if can you evaluate, look at the syllabus, have the AI look at the syllabus, and then ask a question about a skill, such as, would the student be able to evaluate a, an argument well? If I took this class, should I have this skill? So we've done this with the AI and had um, it say yes or no, but then we also asked it, how did you come to that conclusion? And so the, again, the AI writes back to us in a very human English, like this, I looked at the um, assignments and I saw that students need to evaluate legal briefs. Therefore, students who pass this course are likely to be good at evaluating legal arguments. It's a, just a game changer. So those are the two of the areas that I'm most excited about. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I am particularly fascinated by the latest advances in generative models. So uh, in particular, text generation models. And I, yeah, I'm particularly impressed by the quality that has been achieved lately. So when you look at the output of used by these models, you can't really tell whether that has been used by a machine or human. They are practically indistinguishable. Um, but I think that there's something in particular that I like about these things, which is how versatile they seem to be at doing other things that are not just producing text. So by using that as a means, we can now do other things like translate, summarize, adapt text for people with different needs. We can convert unstructured data to structured data or the other way around. So I think that the, the, the advancement of this technology has opened up so many possibilities and now it remains to be seen and, and we have to discuss this, like how far we're going to get, right? And how we can use all this potential to, to solve the problems that we want to solve with AI. If you um, follow any of the sort of tech news channels at the moment, there's been a series of game changer new releases over the last month or so. Um, there's the, 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 the text generating model, GPT-3, has been around for a while, but they had a, re a new release of a new, a new um, a, a upgrade on that, which is just phenomenally good. Uh, you, you, you literally log on, you ask for a poem 
in any subject that's of interest, in any style that you think is relevant, and 30 seconds later, it creates this for you. You can take school homework assignment, paste it in, 30 seconds later, there's a pretty convincing assignment that appears. It, it really is outstanding and kind of hard to comprehend quite how good it is. And then last week, uh, something called ChatGPT came out. And that's uh, uh, by far the best dynamic interaction, sort of chatbot type thing, but like you've never thought of any chatbot before. It uses a bit of the same technology, the same ability to generate complex things, but much like Sarah was describing, you can challenge it and query it. You can ask it questions. It gives you responses. You can go back to that response, and it will iterate and improve its response in a very, very, very human way. It's quite, it's quite outstanding. So these things are appearing right now. They're currently free to use. Lots of, lots of researchers are crawling all over them and trying to understand what, what this means. Um, it used to be possible to read text that was generated by a robot, and you could mostly guess that it was generated by a robot. I, it's very hard to tell reading these ones. It, it really is. It's quite. It's quite hard, and and kind of quite quite amazing. Um, that's on the, the text generation side. Um, I'd love to share a quick picture with you. Nobody has seen this picture before. I made it this morning by pasting that text into an image generator. So. Snowy mountain in forest, men standing around a small campfire, light see night scene with a bright, dramatic sky, very realistic, beautiful composition, highly detailed. This is a bit of software called Mid Journey. It generated that picture just for us. Nobody else has seen it. Um, there's several other tools that do similar level of, of generation. So Mariana was talking about the text generation, but actually image generation um, is increasingly widespread and, and common as well. So it just gives a bit of an insight to the types of things that are possible right now. The challenge for all of us is what we do with that, right? But, but it's, a, uh, it's a really fascinating area. And another, another one I'm, I'm very intrigued and fascinated by is the sort of adaptive technology. So if you're blind or partially sighted, um, tap, tap, see, um, oh, another one I've certainly forgotten the name of, something C, something AI. Um, these, are, these are apps that I can walk around with my phone scanning video where I'm walking, and it's talking to me and telling me what it's seeing. Red door, steps, train track, as, as I'm walking. And these are now fairly mainstream use, normally free to use, using very, very good visual processing data to, to be extracting live data and giving immediate feedback about what you can see. So these are quite transformational tools. Do you want to talk about what GPT-3 stands for? I can, I, okay, We're, I don't, I want to make sure we don't use too much jargon. We've said generative models, we've said GPT-3, we say all these things very quickly, and I'm not sure how much familiarity everyone has. I come to AI through assessment, I'm not an AI scientist, so um, from my perspective, when I hear GPT-3, that stands for, what, generative pre-trained, uh, that's the PT stands for, GPT-3, I don't know if it's probably the third one, I'm guessing creativity there. But again, it's been, what's it been trained on? What's the pre-training refer to? And it's talking about, in, again, in English, all of this, like, just about, I mean, I think of it as everything on the internet. It's been, there's billions of dollars that were put together for these, to train these large language transformer models. And so how did it learn how to speak English? By analyzing all of it. So it can speak it can speak very conversationally. It can also speak, it's, you know, produce text that is very specific to something very, very specific, cutting edge medical um, situations, medical surgery, surgery, how to do surgery, um, also political events. Um, it can come up with predictions about what's happening geopolitically. It's amazing because, again, it's been trained on all these high quality digital references. So that's what, when you hear GPT-3, it's pre-trained, and that's how it learned how to speak English. That's, I don't know, Jeff, you probably have a better. No, that's perfect. <laughs> so, I'm just... And I know you wanted to tell us a little bit about uh, some of the 
cultural neuro thoughts around around um, around okay. AI. Do you still want to? Um, yeah, why not? Uh, so I, these are actually images from um, practical language and culture system. <laughs> Uh, very wordy title, uh, which was developed by Alelo uh, Inc. Uh, in California by Lewis Johnson and his team. Um, and um, the idea here, you see a lot of military people, but it's, it, it is one of the um, most interesting, I think, uh, applications uh, of AI in the military context because it focuses on... Um, teaching, language, and um, cultural nuances to the military staff who are charged with um, missions such as negotiations in, in diverse local contexts. So this is just an example of, um, it, it's actually a, a commercial application. It has de developed, this is an early, an early version, which was which was funded by the by the by the US, U.S. Navy, um, but it has actually um, diversified into language uh, training systems, which are specifically including um, culture as the point of origin, if you like. So it's very contextualized. It, um, it facilita it's facilitated through a diverse um, uh, through diverse means, so you can you can train through I think uh, just a pretty simple um, interfa interface on on your on your laptop or PC, or you can you can train in the cave in a much more uh, immersive uh, virtual reality uh, kind of uh, context and situated. Context. So this idea of AI providing uh, opportunities and environments for situated rehearsal of communication skills is a particularly interesting um, application in the context of and a, language and a, and a lovely, a lovely bridge into the language learning, language practice, um, more experiential aspect of it. Absolutely, and not to mention the fact that actually, given that this is mil a military application, uh, I love the idea that, that you know, the soldiers are trained to resolve problems through understanding culture, through communication, rather than, you know, through guns as, <laughs> as the first kind of... Um, so we thank you very much for the questions. There's several coming in. Quite a few of them are around the assessment ones, but I'll pick some of the non the more broader ones. Will AI be stealing our jobs? Who wants that one? <laughs> I think we've heard that many times before. Um, no, <laughs> I don't see it that way. I think we're just trying to automate probably the most boring uh, tasks so that people could concentrate on more interesting ones. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, for example, in terms of, of, of assessment, so delivering a test or trying to find creative ways of um, assessing speech, for example, so it would be much more interesting, I think, to get insights from the data that we gather by using this uh, amazing technology, see how people interact, uh, use that to, to find out whether we are assessing things the right way, what do we need to change. So I think that we're not taking anybody's job really. We're, we're trying to, you know, make people focus on more interesting tasks and maybe, yes, that we need new skills, so maybe there is a bit of resistance to that, but um, I think this is part of evolution. That's a good thing, actually. And, and I think uh, that, that's such a nice transition over to our next chapter. So we're moving on to chapter two. <laughs> it's not only the positive things. Um, also, stuff doesn't always work out right, or there are scary aspects to it. Several of the questions we've got from you are, are, are in that sort of chapter, that genre as well. Please do vote each other's questions up and down, because I've now got 25 questions, but, but none of them have got more than four or five votes. So um, 
if you want to get yours to the top, you know, that's written well. Um, so um, this is about some of the things that we're worried about as, as, as experts. What are the things that, that, that bring us some pause to thought? Who would like to start off? Well, I, can, I can start. Um, one of the things that I'm, I guess I'm worried about, when we just talked about GPT-3, right? It's trained all in English. So it's the, the large language models, it's not really multiple languages, it's just one right now. So that's going to have some issues, right? We need to move toward um, having different, different languages. And just a, I'm just worried that things are going to go English and then try to translate. And we know how much is lost in those things. So that's one thing I'm concerned about. And that, that really is a big deal. There's the, by English corpus of data and the models are dramatically bigger. There are, there are, there's some coming from Spain, there's some Spanish ones. But the, the data pool is way, way less, so it's so it, it's a lot further behind. There's not a lot in other languages. And and when we ask it to write in another language, it does, but it's and it scares. I'm like, I don't trust that. So we got to watch that. Yeah, yeah no, I, w I was going to add that actually, because we understand some of the languages, yeah. but have pretty much that we understand them in English. Right? Better for the primary source to be in multiple languages. But when you think about it, it's not there. Why not? Think of you know a few steps down the line for five. Yeah. Four, fourth is coming. I'm thinking, why don't we just take a few steps up back or forward to a GPT-5 or a GPT-10 when the translation is a lot better, and just say to GPT, translate yourself into the uh, every language on the planet. And then you, that solves all your problems then. You've got a GPT something for every, everybody. Yeah, it's, it's just that sometimes translation is lost, right? And sometimes it can be. So trans adaptation, for sure. I am going 10. Yes. Okay. I'm just saying. Not tomorrow. I want it to be, have a primary source. There was a question towards the end uh, by, by Sarah. Uh, will anyone need to learn languages in the future, or will technology AI mean we don't need to? So that, that sort of feels like what we're just talking about. What, what's your view on that? I think most people want, want to learn languages. It's already happening. You know, if you, if you struggle uh, or if you want to know how to communicate, you go to Google Translate. Um, I'm generalizing here, but, uh, you know, certainly, certainly from the UK perspective, uh, looking at my limited um, view from the perspective of my own kids. That generation kind of shrugs off the, the need to, um, you know, to, to necessarily make the effort to learn other languages and, and, and just says, you know, we, we have Google Translate. Might because you live in the UK. Well, yes, yes <laughs> I did say from the UK perspective. Crazy that way of thinking about other languages. But it actually raises and an also a, a question around uh, misappropriation of these technologies and questions around how um, AI, which is basically a technology which uh, automates particular tasks, which has um, autonomy to act and to decide in the real world, in the human world, how it might affect our fundamental human capacities. We already see emergent research around, for example, delegating our uh, memory tasks to the technology, our spatial navigation uh, abilities, which I was very happy to talk about as a good thing. So, I mean, the, it's a double-edged sword, you know, in a way, and it also raises another fundamental question um, around, uh, you know, how, what, how, what is desirable, and what questions we should be asking about uh, what what we want AI to support us in. How do we want to be enhanced by technology, and what do we want to retain? as our fundamental kind of abilities to engage with 
each other and, and with our environment. Um, until recently, I was the chief product officer at a language learning app called Babbel. We're, we're, it's quite big in Europe. It doesn't, it's not big in the rest of the world. But we, have, we had millions of students logging in to do language learning, mostly sort of Eurocentric languages. Millions of students. And it was, it was direct to consumers. So it was students paying, parents paying um, to, to, to use this. And this question was quite a, a deep one for us, because if AI is going to take over language learning, that was our business shut down. You know, that, that was our whole reason to exist. There were 700 of us in a big office in Berlin building this app and learning experiences and different technologies. Um, and so we, we agonized quite a lot over exactly this question. And actually, we came up with a very happy response. We think that AI is going to radically change the, the casual use of language, traveling into other places, having a little digital guidebook, digital translator, being able to read documents or books written in other languages. But for almost all the use cases that we had, we always asked our learners, why, why are you learning language? And the vast majority were actually personal. They were human things. It was love. It was travel. It was family. Um, sometimes it was work. But there was, it was all about talking to humans and having human interactions. Um, and our, our view was that's not going to change. Um, there will always be a demand. I, I, I'm, I'm in love. I married a German woman. I fell in love with a German woman. I didn't plan that, but I just did. And so am I not going to learn German? Of course I'm going to learn German, right? And so we, we believe that that is going to continue. In fact, maybe making it easier to travel and meet people of different languages and different cultures will, will make that even more likely. So yes, the translation will be more and more better and better and appear everywhere. But no, that's not enough. The, the fact that we're all enjoying being together face to face is because there's something extra and magic. And I think we'll, we will value those, those the, the speaking other languages more so for those human moments. Next slide. No, no, I think it, sorry. No, I think this was uh, related to what Kashko was mentioning, right? Um, things that we might not want to delegate to AI. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we, we, we've seen some news about how, let's say, AI can go wrong, although I don't believe that AI per se itself is wrong. I think that in many of these cases, it's irresponsible use of the technology. So you should know what these models have been trained for. You should know what is in your data. Um, and take this, especially very controversial decisions with uh, a, a grain of salt. So delegating things like sending someone to jail because a model says that doesn't seem right to me. And I am in favor of technology myself. But I think we still have to have the human factor in, in using this kind of technology for anything. And I think, I think this is a super critical point that Mariana has, has mentioned. Sorry, Barry, you're trying to get in there. <laughs> Too slow. <laughs> it's a super critical point. It's about being able to explain why an AI made a decision. Typically, it's very hard to do, and technologists don't like doing that. But to use them for human decision making, it's critical. So I just wanted to add, it, it's kind of on the back of what you said, but also it relates to what you have said just now. Um, the technologies and the applications that we see are actually half baked, they are one big experiment. And, you know, very often when um, certainly looking from, from the, at it from the researcher's perspective, you know, they are very much experimental and they are not necessarily, uh, for most part, intended for the real world. And there is a tendency, there has always been a tendency with any new um, amazing, potentially amazing technology to be very quickly taken over. AI is a, there is, there is a, you know, there's an AI economy. Uh, there is, there is, uh, it's big business and, and there is a lot of competition and so there is a lot of appetite for great ideas and for jumping basically, um, you know, 
on the opportunities to, uh, uh, to, to dominate the market, uh, you know, using these, these different technologies. Uh, Paolo Blinkstein um, uh, talks about the, we take it from hair factor in the context of the ed tech industry, uh, which is particularly, um, you know, prone to this kind of uh, behavior where there are some uh, ideas being tested and experimented with in, in the, in the uh, research context, and they are not even evaluated. There is no evidence, and there is not sufficient evidence for their efficacy um, in supporting human learning. But at the companies, a lot, I'm again generalizing here, so please forgive me for this, just in the interest of time. Um, it, there is this tendency to, to the you know, of the, we take it from here back to where half baked technologies are then being developed into sellable products. And it's a really important thing to bear in mind that, you know, for us consumers, as users, as beneficiaries, whatever we want to call ourselves of these applications, we need to be really on our toes and we need to question um, what these technologies, whether these technologies are ready to be trusted. The problem is the technologies are already out there and are being used. Exactly. And, and nobody questions it. They just assume that they're working. But I'm just going to take it one step further. And we had in this panel earlier, we heard about the, the privatization, the industrialization, if you like, of the education system, particularly in India. And my concern is that you put the ed tech industry with the industrialization of education and you have a real time bomb waiting for you. Because the people who can't afford real education with real people will end up being educated by systems that we don't actually understand. And it'll drive the divide in society even wider than it is now. That's my biggest concern. And when I think about AI, that's what I think about it when I have a bad night. <laughs> I, I, w I would also uh, just, some of the, the concerns that people have, I, people think, oh, AI is coming, it's coming, it's, and again, as Barry mentioned, it's here. Students are using it right now. They can get on OpenAI, get an account, and do their homework, right? And so teachers need to be aware of that, that going on. And I also think there's people that say, oh, there's a black box factor to AI. Um, so therefore, we need to wait because I can't explain everything that's happening. Um, and I'm concerned about that. I think uh, there's a lot of people who probably can't explain the internet, yet could you imagine not being able to use it? Right, so uh, yes, AI can, we, we need to be careful, especially if the AI is making a decision, as Mariano pointed out. If it's being making the final decision, that's really sketchy. But sometimes if you have the human there watching, whatever, that we can build our confidence, maybe that helps with that black box problem. Um, but I, again, I just don't think we can say, oh, everybody just wait for a minute until we're all on the same page for AI. Uh, it's, it's here and it's coming. So let's, let's educate ourselves and try to be as, as present and participating as much as possible. And, and that's why research is so important because it might look like a black box at the moment, but we should be able to crack it with time and more experimentation. And yeah, I think that that's, um, that's a very interesting point. But however, I have to disagree with your uh, concept of comparing this to the internet, because I think it's very clear how the internet works, for people who know how that works. But the problem with these models, some of these models, is that even the developers and the researchers don't know what is going on. Well, some, some exactly. do, and there are model cards, right? And they have some different ways of publish, publishing yes, about what's happening. that is an approximation. Happening. Well, But yeah. some decisions, unfortunately, we still don't know. And I think that's where some of the um, bias, the bias, the algorithmic bias that comes in is part of that. It hasn't been programmed to have a bias. It's just started with biased data, and it started with, with sort of human biases that are in the data, and, and it just encapsulates that. So. It's very difficult for somebody to actually even understand what's going wrong. Um, so I think it's a really important area to be pushing on. But even if we open the the models, uh, the black box, 
that doesn't guarantee the, the, the share, you know, just, just by, by opening them, we can't guarantee uh, that these systems are trustworthy. There is a necessity for humans to be able to <laughs> critically appraise the decision making that, or the, the decision making support that is that is uh, that AI offers. Uh, otherwise, we end up in uh, situations like we did with the with the AI fiasco in the in the UK. Although I would argue that it was not an AI system; it was just a advanced form of a spreadsheet. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, yeah, we it, we need to go beyond opening uh, the box. And uh, the explanations can also be used for man manipulation. Um, so you've had the kind of exciting chapter, and we've had the oh no chapter. Um, and I'd like to move us on to the the final one because th we've got a flurry of questions, and they're all about this area. And so I'd like to I'd like to give us a bit more time to focus on using AI, the practical realities of using it for language teaching and assessment. Um, I think I might actually start off with a couple of the questions directly, just because there's, there's quite a few. Um, Gemma asks, what work is being done in AI to personalize tests, in effect to make the test more relevant to each individual and generally improve the testing experience? Who wants to tackle that one? Barry, do you want to give that well, I know that there are people in Ireland have been working on that area for about eight to ten years. Uh, they, they, they've done some work on Irish language. But mostly it's in things like sciences and geography. Um, it's been very clunky and it doesn't really work. It, it, I don't believe they're using AI necessarily like yourself, but they're glorified spreadsheets and they're, they're, they're very basic. I don't think anybody has really cracked or even started to crack really the, the application of AI for personalization at the level that we would all like to see. Just ideally, every test should be individualized. That's, that's where we should be going. And I think that actually relates to a point that I think Amos made in the previous panel, um, uh, which, which relates to, um, I can't remember the point that he made actually. <laughs> it was to do with personalization. Yes, that was to do with the personalization and adaptivity, uh, although he didn't put it this way. Um, and I was just sitting there thinking, you know, there is a, a huge contradiction between the aspirations that we have for, for AI and the actual way in which we appropriate AI. So the aspiration is to personalize, to individualize, to, to offer adaptive, bespoke support to individual learners. But the way that we are using uh, technology at the moment is within... Uh, the established system, the, the, the you know, bog standard system that we know, we're actually, we're doing the absolute opposite, and we are standardizing everything. It's one, ah, that's what, that was the point that you, you had made, sorry, but it's one test for everyone. And that, that stands in, in complete contradiction to this idea of personalization, adaptation, bespoke uh, education, empowering learners, uh, to actually follow their own journey and, you know, build on their strengths rather than being cut out by their weaknesses. Yeah, so for uh, the only personalization I know of, at least at, at our company right now, when we start writing questions, there are ways of entering in, like, certain keywords or something that you want a particular item to be about and what have you, and so then about a particular construct by entering in these in, then again, the... Um, Jedry will come up with a question that features those different kinds of, of topics. So it helps that subject matter expert, again, personalize the question. But I think, to your point, the challenge then becomes on the psychometric side. I think that the future of AI, we need to have psychometric models that can support personalization. Get away from this. Everybody has to have this standardized understanding, reliability, validity, all those kinds of things. We need some new measurement models to be able to support the kind of personalization that's coming. That's a bit of a worry, though, isn't it? Because we're already overly dependent on measurement models and assessment, particularly in the US. And I, I really have any time you tell me we need new psychometric models, I, I worry, because we're just going to get new theories of validation that are still based around numbers. And my feeling is that we need to break. We need to stand back 
Ken Robinson is a, a, an old hero of mine. Uh, he sp spent a lot of time talking about how education systems are dead and buried. They were they were designed in the 19th century to meet the, the needs of the 19th century. Assessment, standardized assessment as we now know it, was designed at the same time to meet the needs of the 19th century. We're still working with them, and we're trying to build into the 21st and 22nd century new ways of doing things by looking back and saying, well, how did they do it then? Ideally, we should be looking for the possibility of using AI to help us break away from all of this mass everything and get back down to the individual. And Psychometric, I think, are one of the little dots, but there is only one of the pieces. There's a lot more to it. Well, I think it could be much more, much more specific to the person as a psychometric stroke. So hopefully we're on the same page. And there are, sorry, just to add to this, there are some examples. They are experimental, but there are some really good examples which include the opening up the black box and actually using uh, that method. We, we call them open learner models. Um, so this is this is um, this is a, a, an approach specifically in the in the uh, context of intelligent learning environments. I won't bore you with that, but we can talk about this in the break. But, uh, the idea is that the, the student interacts with the system, the system collects the data, and that data is being given back to the learner. It can be given back to the teacher. It can be uh, used in a combination of interactions between humans as the basis for self-appraisal, for collaborative uh, learning and appraisal, and these are all the methods, there, there is emergent evidence also from this research that shows that it is very conducive to self-explanation, metacognitive skills, um, and it, you know the, the general kind of self-regulation uh, aspect of, of learning, which we are, which are fundamental, and which is something that we are, we are always striving for as, as, as educators. So new ways of thinking with this technology about how we can support learners not following and copying the 19th century system, but actually thinking outside the box. Yeah, I, 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 would, really nice sorry. I, I would definitely add my, my voice to that. I think that um, in a way we're all part of the same problem because we're sitting here probably as, as meaningful innovators, thinking about how to be ready for the future, how to, to assess differently, how to understand language differently, how to use technology differently. But us, the same group of people, are also part of holding it back because it, it really, to really rethink how you would use some of these new technologies, how did image generation, text generation, how you would use that to, under, to assess, not, not a paper-based test, that you test a whole bunch of people with exactly the same tests at the same time of day. I mean, why would you even do that? You're doing that thanks to the Victorian school model, right? If you really were trying to understand what language skills I'm going to need in 10 years' time as a global citizen in a, in a world that I don't quite yet even understand, and which of these tools that are there today might prove useful in, in, in helping me show my abilities, you would start in a different place. But, but because of the businesses and the ecosystems and the schools and the publishers, we, we, there's lots of interlocked pieces of a puzzle that we're all sitting in, we're all part of in different ways. It makes it very, very difficult to really pull it apart and start again. So you, it's hard not to be constrained by yesterday's decisions and yesterday's problem, even though you're trying to go into the future and you're using these future technologies, but you're constraining them, you, you're forcing them to solve yesterday's problem. So you're worried about how can I use this technology to proctor a sort of paper-based-ish test, um, whereas in actual fact you could be using a technology entirely differently to understand how somebody communicates, engages into the future. So I guess I'm just sort of adding more fuel to that particular fire. It's a difficult challenge. It's a challenge for all of us of how to deconstruct the many dimensions of the worlds that we're operating in right now to really understand what are the skills we want to really assess and understand, and what do we consider good language, and what are the technologies that can help us get there. Sorry, that little, little rant, I apologize. I was just trying to enthusiastically join in. <laughs> um, okay, another question from Gemma. Um, what's an ethical concern about using AI to replace a human examiner in an interactive speaking test task? Anyone want to pick that up? Eyes. 
<laughs> bias. Bias. Um, aren't humans biased as well? Humans are biased as well, and that's why AI is biased. Yep. Um, I mean, I would perceive it still as, as a big concern, and again, in combination with uh, the delegation um, to the technology for the decision making, uh, there is a danger of lack of accountability as well. A lot of these technologies are not regulated yet. Uh, so this is a major concern now, whether it is going to be a major concern um, in the future, it's an open question. There are um, uh, there, there, there is a lot happening in this space in, in the context of actually regulating for, for AI, but education lags behind. And AI for education lags behind uh, the, the mainstream uh, AI. But bias is the main the main issue, and we have actually seen that with the uh, with the A level fiasco where we had uh, bias um, again with the caveat that it's not really AI, but it's just a very simplistic example of how technology is misused, misused and how bias plays out in the in the real world, where schools that have been traditionally um, less affluent with fewer resources and with worse uh, re historically worse results were disadvantaged by the system uh, because it was averaging so any any votes for <laughs> that was a strong vote against um any votes for ai ai sort of as, as well, so I, I have a couple of questions or points i think um, one way that we tend to try to look and make sure to avoid bias and increase diversity is by increasing the number of people involved. I want to get lots of people involved in my system, so then I have a lot of eyes on it. But that's just still a number of people. Can't you train AI to represent? And it might increase diversity a, a quite a bit, a perspective. Does that make sense? Like if you train it that way, then you don't need that many individuals. You can actually train and train more and more because AI is such a learn. So that's one thing I yeah, and, and I and I guess from the from the sorry. from the learning from the if you've got an AI examiner, if we've been AI kind of interlocutor that you're speaking with, that can be a fantastic practice opportunity because you could you could practice multiple times again and again and again without needing there to be a human there. So and that that brings a different kind of accessibility because some people who might struggle financially or practically to be, or, or or because they're very shy to have meaningful back and forth conversations with a with a, with a human interlocutor in practice, you can do it with, with a robot. So I, I, I think I would be nervous if that's the only way that somebody is assessed. There's lots of examples of that going very badly wrong. But I would also be nervous to throw the, throw the tech away and say, no, 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 it has to be people, because I think there's a lot of bias with people too. Um, it also depends what scale you're doing this at, and what is the purpose of assessment, and what is the context broader context within which assessment happens. So one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of in terms of assessment from the perspective of somebody who teaches and assesses and and often struggles with the idea of, of assessment because you know you have so many essays to, to mark and and for the most part they they are the same. I would be really sad as a teacher to actually lose uh, the ability to, to assess students' work because it's my conduit to my students. I get to know the students and, and their, their capacities, their capabilities, their knowledge, and it informs the way that I teach. Um, so I think there has to be a, a, a nuanced discussion around assessment in context with, with the specific, you know, with, 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 with the knowledge. Um, of the, the specific goals that we have in doing the specific forms of assessment. But I think we have to be practical and sensible as well, because if I'm a government and I, I'm not a, a, an oil-rich government and I've got a couple of million kids that I need to assess um, and I don't have the resources to put into training and really finding enough people who are fluent enough or proficient, as you say, enough in a particular language to assess it, well then I'm screwed basically. 
So what I need, therefore, yeah. is a practical solution that I can roll out. I, I, I do think bias to bias is something we have to keep hammering on about there. Because what we, and the challenge is for us to find ways of, of reducing the bias enough that we can we feel we have enough control over it to let it loose. Because humans have bias. We know humans have bias. We know that people make decisions about other people within about three seconds of meeting them. But they may not have said anything. So we know that bias exists in humans. We, we also know that humans are black boxes. My friend Tom Lumley did his PhD on human scoring uh, of the GSL, you know, ASL PR test in Australia some years, about 20 years back, 15 years back. And he found that he got the best examiners. He asked them to score a bunch of uh, performances. They scored them. They scored them perfectly as measured by the psychometrics behind it. They then, they all awarded similar they got the exact same scores for every performance. And then when they were asked to describe why they did it, they all differed. So humans are black boxes as well. We don't know. We often don't know why we've given the score ourselves. So it's, it's a very complicated issue, but it is a challenge. And I'm saying we should face that challenge. We urgently need to face the challenge. But we do know that humans are biased, whereas there is there's a danger with, with technology. But we don't know how they're biased. No, but we can ask them. But, yeah. but they go to admit it. I, yeah, no, probably not. But the AI, the AI will There's admit it. There's a certain accountability. Yeah. <laughs> can you even ask? You can, you can ask the AI how it's biased. You can turn it on its own. Uh, it what other questions? The that, that's the ambition. So, so we have, we have uh, a, a couple of minutes left and quite a lot of questions. So thank you for your questions. I know we didn't manage to get to all of them. What I'm going to do is read just the next two or three or four questions down the list, and then I'm going to ask each of the people on our panel to give a, a very brief closing remark about what they would advise all of us to be thinking of in the future. You don't need to answer the questions directly. I'm just reading them so that you've got a bit of a, a, a set of context. About, um, so, and so I want just your, your, your advice to the, to the audience. So the, it was a government one. Should government do more to regulate how AI is used to prevent extreme monetization of learners and testers with potentially negative consequences? Um, Jamie asks, since we're feeling different bits of the elephant when we use sh the shorthand, shouldn't we always discuss the applications and stop, stop using the term AI, a general term? Um, will AI steal our jobs? And oh, we had that one, I'm sorry. Um, will technology, instant translation, etc., lead to less EME in 10 years from now? In other words, lectures will use their L1. Or will tech innovation speed up EME? Um, will AI make assessment less expensive for economically disadvantaged students? All right, I'm going to stop with those questions. They were wonderful. Thank you very much for, for helping us out. And I'm just going to ask, run, run down the group of panels, and what's your advice? Uh, well, I think that it all boils down to our responsibility as developers and users to be fully aware of the limitations of this kind of technology and make decisions based on that. Uh, I think we have to be really clear on what it can and can't do and obviously the consequences of making those decisions. So I definitely advocate for a man-in-the-middle approach to using AI in whatever we do in just education. Okay. Right, man-in-the-middle approach. I like that. W Sorry. Woman in the middle? Yeah. <laughs> of Good course. Point. <laughs> Sorry, I was being very politically incorrect. Um, yeah, so we're talking about uh, will AI steal our jobs and can we make, uh, can AI help make assessments more uh, affordable or helping so? Um, I, as far as making it more affordable, not stealing anyone's job. Again, I think that um, the opportunities with the, some of the AI and assessment, it can really free up subject matter experts. People are writing questions. You can literally have dials with creativity, ask it to do more things. So I'm hoping it makes people's lives better. But again, uh, having that human in the loop kind of approach, I think we all agree, is really important. And remember Sarah's sunglasses, be a spy. <laughs> Observe it with the, with the learning frame. That's a advice. <laughs> um, question. Always question. Don't accept um, the technology on face value. And another thing that I would say, and this is a, you know, this is a mission of mine, is to 
is to involve um, teachers and learners as active agents, stakeholders in this in this whole business of developing technologies and developing the ways um, in which the technology is being used. So turning you, <laughs> us, some of us who are not engineers, from consumers to creators. And Barry, the, the final word. I'll add to the fourth question first. Yes, 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 yes. Three questions, can they? Advice, you stole my, quest, my advice question. But I think in, in the same way as you're right with your bias, my bias, you're absolutely right with the question. I would say question, question, question. It's the most important thing. Never accept anything on its face value. We've been doing it in education, regular education for so long. How many methods are there that you've read about this? You go bonkers trying to catch up and keep up with all the methods. Everything is the new great thing. AI at the moment is the new best thing in the world. It's probably not. So I just want to say thank you very much to all of our amazing panelists for a, a really fun conversation. I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I hope you did too. And thank you for your help with the questions and for this big elephant and trying to make sense of it. Thank you.